Please enjoy the legendary David Stewart of the Eurythmics in conversation about online collaborations with Rolling Stone's Simon Vosnick Levinson. Should be a cool session, man. Can't wait. Hey, Dave, thanks so much for being here with us. Uh, where are you joining us from right now? I am joining you. It's very nice to be here or there. Um, I'm joining you from a very tiny island. It's only half a mile wide, two miles long. And I'm uh, hoping and praying the internet connection stays on because uh, this little island, it goes on and off all the time and various other things go on and off all the time. And I've been here for about two and a half months, three months, and actually doing quite a lot of recording and working with people in different parts of the world, which is something that we obviously have to do. Uh, fortunately, I've done that quite a few times, especially with Thomas Lindsay, who we have a record out right now. That, But that was because Thomas is somebody who doesn't like to leave uh, his little town in Louisiana. And um, the few times he did, hit five in the morning, he was back at the airport to get the plane back. So, <clears throat> well, that was fine with me because um, it was an interesting uh, thing, just getting little s snippets of him singing in thin air, you know, a cappella, and working out what music to make behind it. But always within the kind of blues vernacular you know but but going back through the years obviously um i'm usually with a person <laughs> with a person at least um so it, it's a, a very odd time but i mean i put all music aside and everything and thinking about the time we're in generally you know um i don't know if this is i think it might be coming out next week or this is next week to people who think we're not doing it this week <laughs> um, the time we're in makes and myself and I'm probably everybody else just wonder what the new normal is going to be and I think it's up to people cultural engineers or whatever you want to call them uh, to start carving out their idea of that new normal Yes, I, I think many people would say that this is a time when the world needs art and needs music in some ways more than ever. I, would you agree with that? I agree with that, but I also think we need to think of that lo local, you know, um, to sustain. So what has been forgotten over the years, and I remember after the war, my father and most men with families in England were given what's called an allotment, which is a small piece of land, tiny, but enough to grow vegetables and stuff for the family. And, you know, if you think about at one point, I think 80% of planes were grounded. And where were they grounded? You know, because they take up so much space and how will they, do we even want to start again the total, you know, annihilation? of the planet um, by so much um, carbon emissions and so, you know, there's just so much stuff that you could sort of alter slightly in your life, make a massive difference. And one of the things is uh, just thinking local. So it's obviously easy to think local on this little island because you can walk to, you know, everybody and you can walk anywhere. And, you know, you know great guy, cool. <laughs> um, I won't say people's names, but, you know, he'll throw some uh, arugula over the wall or some uh, sweet potatoes or something, and there's somebody fishing down the road. Um, for a lot of people in inner cities and, and those kind of areas, very crowded areas, more sort of geared towards working, you know, for a corporation and so forth, I think you know, those kind of people obviously have to think about, well, let's stay at home and work if I can. You know, I mean, people have been doing it. Lots of the companies have not fallen down. 
because most of the stuff they were doing were like this, Zoom calls, emails, and keeping things going. The trouble is, a lot of people forget about everything that they order, whether it's on Amazon or anywhere. Some guy is in a truck somewhere, and like, never mind whether there's a pandemic or anything, people still go, hey, where's my Amazon? It's late, you know, and it's like, hell yeah. Yes, it's it's a new world that I think we're all adjusting to and that, that some people have more adjusting to do in terms of understanding the, the reality we live in, right? Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about just as for you as a, a creative artist, as a musician, what's it like trying to create, come up with ideas, come up with inspiration in a socially distanced era? Well, um, I've in a way been going local myself. So yesterday I was recording um, a trombone player and a trumpet player from the island who usually play in a thing called Junkanoo. It's a certain way of playing, which I love, and uh, slightly like the New Orleans Funeral March or something like that. And I've been uh, recording them and mixing it up with very sort of dub kind of, <clears throat> uh, you know, sounds and creating something that I'm writing it's kind of like a, a Netflix or a Hulu type of series set in the Midlands in Britain in the Jamaican community. So I've been making music for that. And at the same time, Thomas Lindsay and I call ourselves Stuart Lindsay. I've ma been making homemade iPhone sort of films, videos. We're doing one for every song on the album. So there's nine songs on the album. And, um, and tying them together somehow, because he's on his own in the middle of Louisiana. So, um, yeah, I've been working with some local musicians, and then I've been recording um, an amazing singer in Britain, Beverly Knight, she's called Soul Singer, um, for this thing I was describing, you know, this series. But she's been in London, and then my engineer at works here, Neil, he went home to visit his mom about three months ago to, and thinking he was going to come back well, that, a bit more than that. And well, while he was in uh, Florida, he caught the virus. So he thinks he might have caught it in CBS when he went to get something for his mom. And of course, it was kind of a weird situation because he went there to sort of was his stepmom actually help her but he can't go near her so he's been in sort of isolation and it took a long time for it to uh, go away he sometimes feels better and does something and then he has 102 degrees fever in the night again and so um <clears throat> but he's been doing some stuff and then my great friend Ula Romo who was a drummer in Eurythmics for a while has been mixing things in Switzerland and um, a drummer called Randy Cook has been playing drums for me in Los Angeles and all these files are sort of flying about and eventually come to rest to be mixed you know. <clears throat> uh, I was actually all the way through Eurythmics career I liked not recording in a normal way so you know we might be recording in a picture framing factory when in the eaves of a picture framing factory when we're doing sweet dreams then we recorded it in a sort of disused church but even when we got really successful i said let's record in a youth club on the outskirts of paris in the suburbs you know and we had a room not very big and we made, you know, Would I Lie to You and Bear It, you know, songs there. So I like, a bit like Brian Eno, I suppose, I'm more interested in the atmosphere and the situation and what's going on, as opposed to being in a padded cell and just trying to write a hit. I'm just sort of, I have to feel something, but not just in the playing of something I have to feel something about where we are so when Annie and I were in it's kind of like the Russian quarter in Paris 
it was really good because we always stop at 7.30 or 8 and I still do and have a large drink. Um, <clears throat> we would go to this like, Russian restaurant and knock back sort of vodka with these Russian people and, you know, eat their food and dance about or whatever and then pass out back at the place we were renting to stay. And it created this whole different vibe. So right here, um, it's quite interesting because <clears throat> beside me here is this guitar that I got ages ago. Night, you know, it's a dog guitar and um, sounds different to, uh, oh, why it's a bit annoying, but um, in a minute, that might work. Most people <clears throat> associate and recognize it, obviously, with early blues music. And so I was obsessed with uh, blues music for years because my cousin went to Memphis when he was about 17 or 18, and he actually sent us a box up to Sunderland in the northeast of England, where I'm from, and to me, me and my brother. And when we opened it, there was some Levi corduroy jeans, which we couldn't believe. We were like so exotic. And underneath that was like, you know, um, Robert Johnson, King of the Delta Blues, Singers, Mississippi, John Hurt, Big Bill Brunsey, vinyl albums. It sounded kind of like alien music at first, but because I'd had my leg broken and nothing to do, I wasn't really interested in music. I put them on and there was something about the sound of it that was just gave me chills and I was just couldn't really work out when I first heard Bob Dylan actually his sort of voice and whining and folk mixed with blues gave me a, a reminded me of that and then years later when I knew him I was talking to him he knew all of these blues artists obviously and when I made the film Deep Blues uh, he was it was just so spot on when I play him something from it. He goes, "Oh yeah, that's Jesse May Hemphill," and I go, oh, God, "How do you know that?" Like, it's hardly ever been recorded, you know. But he had research. In fact, he wanted to make a film. I remember with me after that, going up into the mountains, you know, bluegrass, and finding before it faded away. Because uh, deep blues, <clears throat> a lot of the people who were filming and field recording with Robert Muggy, you know, great sort of filmmaker. And then Robert Palmer, who was based on the book, he wrote Deep Blues. Uh, a lot of the players were, you know, getting on a bit in their seventies or whatever. But that's that sound, you know. What I love about a lot of uh, the early blues music, which you weirdly, you'll hear in Sweet Dreams. <laughs> but it, it sounds bizarre because Sweet Dreams are very electronic, but it's just going round and round on one chord in the same beat, and they would do that. Well, you know, like, and sing that blues thing, and they might go like. But basically, it's the same chord with little interspersed kind of dialogue on the guitar. <clears throat> and Arnold Burnside does this great one called Jumper on the Line that has that sort of energy, um, but it never really changes chord, but you don't care. You know, you want it to go on for like an hour. It sounds great, the, the Dobro, it's beautiful. Um, it's interesting you mentioned those great early blues artists because many of them, you know, they weren't recording in luxurious recording studios either, right? They were making do with the circumstances exactly. they had yeah. in the art there. Do you think there's a lesson to be kind of leaned there? Yeah, um, no, they weren't, well, either they weren't, they weren't recording at all, or, or some guy arrived, an enthusiast, <clears throat> uh, one guy in particular, and um, he would have a microphone, and they'd be in a, a really messed up, cheap hotel room, or outside somewhere, and um, I really think it's amazing that when people do that, you know, and... Uh, 
they capture stuff in almost like needed for the Smithsonian archive or something, the roots of things. Actually, a friend of mine called Michael Apted, <clears throat> he made a series called Seven Up. I don't know if you've seen any of it. Mm -hmm. I met somebody at 14, 21, 28. Uh, it's really fascinating to watch. Um, you know, kids talking about their dreams and aspirations. You see them at 14. Some of them have got in trouble. Some of them are studying, whatever. 20, you know, somebody might be in jail. Other person's at university. And then how their lives change and interweave. And, you know, nothing. Now it's right up to 60 or something like that, maybe. But any, anyway, um, <clears throat> how music has gone through these transitions. <clears throat> Sorry. It's interesting for me because even though, you know, we went through every kind of variation of death metal to absolute pop to whatever, you know, I can always hear some kind of blues in it, you know, it's like cooking and there's one ingredient that might always be going through whatever, you know, in whatever country. They have some variant of an ingredient. And for me, that ingredient is blues in Indian music, African music, high life, whatever, you, you know, you know, dubstep, reggae music, whatever. I, I particularly hear a certain kind of blues and to me, it's kind of linked in a way to some kind of voodoo or grigri or whatever you want to call it, like Dr. John, you know, Night Tripper album or Leon Russell or going all the way through to um, today. I mean, just last week I was writing on Zoom like this with Gary Clark Jr., you know, and uh, <clears throat> Obviously, he's an amazing blues artist and very important right now with uh, his, art, his last album, particularly, you know, he kind of said well, most of the stuff that is happening now. As he said the other day, look, you know, he's like six foot four black man, like seems like a huge threat. He's just crossing the road or whatever. And he's always like looking over his shoulder, you know. So, um, but anyway, I, I hear uh, the blues and the influence of the blues and going all the way back to the roots of um, African and Indian music. I hear it throughout all music, unless it's some kind of, I don't know, Disney type pop music that has lost and then, you know, it's, it's like candy floss and you can't hear anything. Um, Dave, I, I wanted to go back to uh, even a little bit earlier than you were talking about, just to the very beginning of your Rhythmics career, because I, I find that fascinating. Um, you and Andy recorded the first Rhythmics album in Cologne with Connie Plank, is that right? He taught me, uh, Connie Plank taught me actually how to record. He, he sort of deconstructed the myths about recording. And then a chap called Holger Sukai, who was a member of Can. The first album that Annie and I made, you know, was like Jackie Liebsight playing the drums and Robert Gall from Deutsche American Friendship. And, and then uh, Holger Sukai playing on bass and some things, French horn on some things. Marcus Stockhausen, Stockhausen's son. And, you know, and even before that, the first thing Annie and I ever released was with uh, two of Throbbing Gristle, Chris and Cozy Fanny Tootie. And we, as a couple, you know, obviously we lived together and we were in another band and made of three albums, but we didn't write anything. We just were a very closed off couple that um, were talking a lot. <laughs> so when, when we decided we were getting a bit of folly, a dub, I'd just be constantly just us all the time. Annie moved upstairs when I was downstairs and 
when she went to Scotland to visit her parents, I started experimenting with a tiny synth for Space Echo, um, a Tascam four track cassette recorder, and one other thing, dramatics or something like that. And we'd already been to Connie Planks, and I'd already realized Uh, yes, all the times I've been in the studio and been told to sit at the back and don't touch the board and the producer and the engineer were in charge. I was like, fuck that, you know. And Connie would let me just do anything, you know, like, hey, look, turn that, just do that whole thing if you want. Just get the bass drum and just turn the gain up so it's just distorting. And then we'll add this other big drum that will bang with it, you know. And it was so much fun. And I was like, okay, I'll hang the mic out the window and I'll record the kids playing in the street and I'll mix that into this. I'll go down Camden Town tube station and record the squeal of the train wheels and mix it with a slide guitar, which is on the Sweet Dreams album on a track called um, The City Never Sleeps. And I just started to follow their non-rules, kind of there are no rules. And that has opened up my world and life to many things, you know. And and sometimes I'm with people and it shocks them, like, what? <laughs> like, you know, in a recording session. And then they like it too, you know. Like, they've been told, you have to do it like this, you have to do it like that. Now, fuck it, no. It's, if you want to sing outside, sing outside. You know, if you want to, you know, whatever. Uh, oh, you want to play the bass through a wah-wah pedal? Great, you know. Um, another fantastic time I had recording, actually, was making my album Greetings from the Gutter. And I decided to play with Bootsy Collins, Bernie Worrell, and Jerome Bigfoot Braley, which was basically P-Funk's rhythm section. And Bernie Worrell, amazing keyboard player, you know, played the talking heads, but I can't even explain how brilliant he was. He, he didn't really know what he was doing, but he didn't, it didn't matter because it was just everything sounded great. And unfortunately, he passed away. Um, but... Um, that was so much fun because I was in Electric Lady Studios. And what happens to me is I think once you create this atmosphere of anything can happen, quite exciting. People want to pop in. So Lou Reed was living around the corner. And he would come in for a bit. And he ended up, I asked him, did he want to play a guitar solo? He's like, nobody ever asked me to play a guitar solo. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he's obsessed with all the you know, the sounds and the distortion. Of it. He went home and he was messing around for ages and I went to see him and he had a setup that was totally like fuzzed out. I said, yeah, that sounds great. So he came and played this, this weird, long bending, fuzzy kind of guitar solo on the end of a song. And then um, people would come and visit and there's a song called Jealousy I wrote with uh, Bootsy had started this amazing groove, but on it you can hear Nick singing back vocals, and Sly Stone, and just, it was a madhouse. And, um, but the most fun ever, and people were having the most fun ever, you know, Lady Miss Kia came over from Delight just about every day and hang about in the studio, and then she ends up singing on some songs with <clears throat> the back and vocalists, and um, I think every album has been like that, really. Yeah, and right, and it's given you an incredible career. That spirit of freedom and openness to collaboration, I think, is something that's you know really remarkable. And when you look back on all of the work that you've done, um, do you have any advice for people who are feeling stuck creatively now, who want to kind of open themselves up to inspiration, open themselves up to that spark of freedom? Um, I think first thing is to get your hands dirty, you know, in the sand pit, and throw away all the rule books and think about how you feel. That's the most important thing. And if you're collaborating with somebody, how they feel, it this sounds a bit vague, but I mean, I'm, I don't, you know, any art form, you have to think about what you're feeling first. And after you've sort of figured out how you feel, then how do you interpret that into whatever, a synthesizer part, a, electric guitar, uh, you know, a painting or whatever. Because if you don't really feel much while you're doing it, 
nobody's going to feel much while they're listening to it. And if you don't feel much while you're listening to a back and it comes on the radio, then you sort of want to hide or shoot yourself. You know, not, not shoot yourself. But So the thing is, starts with you know, you know, expressing yourself emotionally, but forget about the rules. Don't start off the other way around. Don't start off going, oh, I don't know how to work this. I don't know how to work that. So therefore, I can't do anything. If Patty Smith did that, she would have never heard of anything, right? She just want write words and express herself on the stage and people joined her because bloody hell like fantastic have you seen that dylan film where she gets up on stage really young yes so like good. Eight, how old she's like 18 or 19 or something and she just comes on and it's like whoa um so yeah you know it's a bit like joe strummer would say you know three chords start a band um you know, he was such an amazing character and he was like, he's like, don't care about any rules. Just gonna sort of make this noise and like write these words on top of it. And a lot of the records that I listened to were when people ignored the rules, like Marvin Gaye, what's going on? I mean, the label didn't want him to do that, you know? And he was very depressed, corny. His career, like he was in this kind of genre, but he wanted to really say something and express himself. And um, I get obsessed with things like string arrangements. Like, so I was once in the Motown archive. You can imagine it, it's like you almost can't breathe, right? Every tape you look at that's been carefully kept in storage has got Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell or you know it's just the supremes or whatever it is so i listened to marvin Gaye and tammy terrell and was allowed to sort of have the separate faders and um so it was just they're both singing around the same mic so it's quite sweet amazing vocal all the way through and then at the end tammy terrell says do we have to do it again you know and uh, but then i put up one fader and it was the most incredible string arrangement. It was like, I didn't even remember hearing it on the record, but when you took it out of the record, the record sounded completely kind of dead. And you put the string arrangement in, and it's got harps and pizzicato and flutes, little uh, everything going on, and strings and, you know, a huge sound. I said, hey, who did that string arrangement? <laughs> And they went through this thing, oh, oh, it's this chat. Um, and I said, oh my God, I've got to ring him up, right? And now he's probably about 70 odd or 80, I don't know. <laughs> so I rang him up and I said, excuse me, sorry, I'm ringing here from Motown, it's a, you know, archive. And I was just amazed at the string arrangement. I think you did it. He goes, what's it called? I said, it's called, it ain't nothing like the real thing. He goes, oh, can you play a bit of it? <laughs> so I sort of played a bit down for him. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that one, you know. But I'm like, God, like genius, you know. Um, Dave, that's, I love that story. Um, I'm afraid we're reaching the end of our time here, but this has been a, a great conversation. It's, it's amazing to hear all these stories and, and to hear from you, a person who's so sort of open to inspiration and, and creativity. I, I love it. Um, Dave, thank you so much for joining us here at Advertising Week JPAC. Uh, we're all looking forward to hearing your next collaborations and the music that comes out of this time from you. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you. <laughs>